We're going to be doing today's update. Brad Larson here, Property Manager Mastermind. Give you the signature. Hello, the happy hands. Deb, give me some happy hands. Maddie, happy hands. Thank you. Jazz right. hands. Jazz right. hands. Today, a daily COVID update for 20 March, 2020. I hope I didn't put the wrong date in there. It'd be kind of embarrassing. Nope, I do have the right date. And we're streaming live every day at 4.30. Now, this is a workaround, gang. I had to go into YouTube to post a live stream from Zoom to get Matt and Deb in here. So it's a workaround. It's a little different. You'll have to tag into the YouTube to check it out, but it should give us a way to do this. And then we'll go back in there and make sure it's all printed out. Okay. Let's get into it. So today's Friday, 20 March. We are in the middle of this madness. There's a few things that we want to talk about that were popping up today that are that is news. Uh, the first thing that excited me, I heard this a couple hours ago, was the IRS extended the filing deadline and the payment deadline for our income taxes for the businesses from 15 April, which is typically the normal, to 15 July. Deb, Matt, am I correct on this one? You are correct. All right. Backing up a little bit, Deb, you got to say hello to our audience and give us a quick intro. Hi, everyone. Deb Newell here, Real-Time Consulting Services. I do consulting for property management companies. And you own a property management company in and Minneapolis. And I own a property management company in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and a maintenance company in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Well done. That's why I had you on, because you know what you're talking about in this realm. Matthew introduced himself yesterday. We're all tired of hearing from him anyway. So <laughs> uh, other than the... What, what effect does the IRS news have for you? So Matt, what do you think of that news from the IRS? Yeah, I think this is exciting from a cash flow perspective. I mean, one of the things I've been telling everybody is, hey, you need to go out and figure out, uh, you know, some sort of objective measure of how much cash you're going to need to withstand a kind of worst case scenario. And obviously, if your business made money last year, you don't have to, and you, don't, you had an filed your quarterly uh, estimates, or maybe you still owe some money even after filing your quarterly estimates. This will help us with, from a cash flow perspective, help us extend that out in, into July. And then hopefully we can figure out what's going on uh, before then with this coronavirus stuff. Good stuff. Matt or uh, Deb, go ahead. No, I, I, I echo what Matt has said. I agree. I think it's going to help with the cash flow for businesses um, and, you know, for a lot of people who have LLCs, it's going to help them because they're, you know, having to file personal taxes along with their business. And so I think there's a lot of benefits for that as well. Just, you know, my only call out is make sure that just because it's postponed that we're still, you know, we, we, we don't want to still wait till the very last minute. In fact, they actually encouraged if you can file, please file, especially if you're trying to get a refund, if, if that's possible, you know, to file still ahead of time and not wait till the very end. Cause we all know what's going to happen. It's going to, you know, just clog up that whole piece of it as well. Yeah. But it does give you some time. I mean, uh, from oh, an does, entrepreneur yeah. standpoint, I'm always doing taxes last minute. Uh, the last week has been completely chaotic trying to figure out what to do. What's a plan for the business. And now I have some extra time. I don't have to be worried about getting, you know, all the information to the tax accountant. Now I can take some time and uh, hopefully kind of focus on this coronavirus kind of plan. All right, good. So give me some other headlines that we want to talk about. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, the, uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk about was the, um, uh, the uh, again, the SBA, two different loans. One of the things I figured out, I've been talking a lot about SBA loans, the, the, the disaster loans. There's actually two different types out there. One you can get directly from your bank, uh, which is basically six weeks of payroll. Um, and it's almost like a no doc type loan, pretty easy to get. But now I'm told through a good friend of mine that there's all, you can also go directly to the SBA. So now they have a fund. Uh, as soon as your area gets declared a disaster, so you go to sba.gov, disaster relief or whatever, uh, certainly it's probably all over the homepage. You can literally, as soon as your county uh, in your state gets declared a disaster zone, you can apply for a, a more traditional SBA loan. Now, you're get, this has more documents and it's going to take two to three weeks to get it done. The other one to your bank is very much a very quick loan that you can get money fast. This one's a more long-term kind of more solid kind of, you know, bigger, bigger number loan that you can hopefully uh, help you say, sustain it. So I'm suggesting to everybody to 
to do both. I mean, what, what's the harm in trying? Um, but the SBA, the one going directly to the SBA is going to take you a lot more time, a lot more focus. I started that. I started that application process this morning, uh, linked to me from Seacoast Commerce Bank, because that's who RentWorks banks with, and went to go in there. And unfortunately, Texas and Bear County have not been declared an emergency according to the SBA. They have been, right? Governor Abbott came out and declared Texas in a state of emergency. So that should be updated any minute. But I, I basically like reached a dead, uh, dead end there this morning as I was looking at it. Deb, have you investigated any of this at all so far? Yeah, actually I have as well. And on our, in Minnesota, if you go to, they have a special COVID-19 page and it will actually alert us. You can sign up for an alert to let you know when the SBA portion will be available. It's not yet. So it was announced way before it was available to even be, you know, to apply for here. Okay. So Deb, a couple of questions for you, because, you know, yeah. we talked to um, some inspectors and we've talked to some property managers. Uh, you know, from your perspective, since you own a maintenance company, what mm -hmm. changes, what differences, what shifts are you making right now to still conduct maintenance under the property management side? I mean, what are you doing in your business right now? Well, and I've seen a lot of this on Facebook as well. So I feel like a lot of people are taking this approach where we're doing only emergency maintenance as needed. So we're still, you know, non, uh, using that word non-essential, right? That that most governors have been using for, for that um, coin phrase. But to say if, if it's a non-essential maintenance need, we're not going to do it. We're going to postpone it. Now they can request, you know, we use property melt, so they can definitely go in and request it and we can um, schedule that out. Um, so at least we're doing all of that. The other thing that we're planning for is to plan for our move-ins and move out accordingly. So we're actually getting those mapped out on the calendar now. So we actually can track where our technicians are going to be and, and when. That's going to be really important, important on our end. Um, just so, you know, we're doing move-ins, um, self-move-ins now and self-move-outs now. So we have to coordinate lock boxes and things like that, keys in the property and all of that. So that's one piece of it. And then um, handling any maintenance that would come up after a move-out occurs um, and really just planning accordingly if you know who's going to be in the property and when so that there's not a lot of cross contamination or or, or, or any concerns like that mm -hmm. one, one of the steps we just implemented here this week because we rolled out a revised resident benefits package is uh, we rolled in a new a new software basically called simple bills and that's with a real page and that's where the mm -hmm. utilities are being yep. carried let me tell you something this is effing scary and I can say that because there's been some reports of utility providers, utility companies, not, not turning on utilities for new incoming tenants, right? Really? Hmm. I think if that happens, now all of a sudden the tenant can't move in because they have no power, they have no water, they're not going to be paying rent, and you can't get your management fees, and you also can't get your, your owners their portion. How substantial is that? Because utility companies are basically saying, we're not doing any more move-ins. We're not going to meet you at the property and turn your gas on. We're not going to flip the switch. we got other stuff to do. How scary is that? Now, think of the solution. If you have a solution to where that utility never gets turned off, like in that, in that scenario of utility management, that never happens. So this is, right. this is something that's just becoming light to me. Like, oh, man, this is now a no-brainer on implementing this because uh, – it's going to basically turn those utilities on one time and they never turn off. It's just the billing process is, is different. You build a tenant, you build the owner when it's their side, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that kind of became apparent. And this is something I'd recommend to everybody is we just, again, implemented this as part of our resident benefits package is we implemented a system called my walkthrough, which is a method for a new incoming tenant to do their own uh, basically inventory and condition form. Right. In Texas, we have the six page inventory and condition form that's like stubby pen and paper. Right. And you go in there as a tenant, you fill it in with your pencil and your pen and and you annotate things that you see in writing. Right. There's no place to do pictures. It's in it's in on a form. They're supposed to fax or scan it to you or mail it to you. And they got to do that within three days. So this is a no brainer. And there's several other softwares that do this. It might be the inspector has something like this. And we just implemented something called my walkthrough. And essentially what happens is we give the tenant a system to do their own inventory and condition form electronically 
They can take their pictures. They can do all that themselves, which means we don't have to necessarily go there and help them do a move in orientation in person, right? They can document all those things they see on their own, which means one less staffer has to go to the home. Right. Okay. That, that's where the bottom line is and all that junk I just said. So uh, having said all that, Matt, wake up. Now it's your turn. <laughs> yeah, the other thing I would say is around liability of move out and move in. Uh, one of the things we've done is we're letting the house sit for at least 48 hours pre-move in and uh, post-move out so that, uh, you know, apparently this, we talked about it yesterday, but this uh, stuff generally dies in 48 hours on all surfaces. Some people say three days. Uh, by the time we do the 48 hours, it basically gets us to that three day, uh, you know, the next day. So, um, we're, t we're doing a moratorium on moving, like we're not, we're not touching the house for 48 hours so we can tell residents, Hey, you don't have to worry. You know, you don't have to walk in and, and basically disinfect the whole place because everything's been not been touched for, uh, two to three days. And on the move out, we're doing that just to keep our people safe. Well done. Well done. So open forum, who wants to say something now, Deb, what do you got for us? Well, one of the things I've been working with with my clients is actually, you know, so everybody's working from home and for a lot of them, they were either prepared or they weren't prepared. And so we were, we now, were not. So to, okay. to cut you off there and I'll let you go after a minute, but no, we, were not, we were not prepared. We had to kind of go through something on the fly. I'm a firm believer that you don't get as much productivity, but this is something in a situation to where we have to kind of make this exception now. And so we're working through that challenge. I'm sure Deb, you're coaching some of your clients on how to do this. Go ahead. Yeah, so I'm basically helping them do this business continuation plan. So if they didn't have one in place, it's putting one in place now. And it's coming up with ideas and things that, and policies and procedures that they can put in, you know, put in place for their employees who are working remotely, um, that they are measuring how they're doing that. They're using reporting the way that they should be using reporting. Um, and I'm also kind of um, really consulting them and saying, this is a great hard reset. So for all of those people who had employees and we all, you know, we've all come across um, companies or have seen this where they have employees where they're like, gosh, they, they've always just given 50% or they've always just, you know, I, they're just not great and they haven't really done their job well. Um, think of this as a really good opportunity for both accountability um, on that employee's part and a way to start measuring how well they are doing. And it could be a hard reset for both you as the employer and for the employee. Either they rise to the occasion or they don't. And, you know, there's going to be others who are looking for jobs. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit yesterday and the, the looking for jobs yeah. thing, uh, to touch on that. If we see this spike in unemployment, all of a sudden, the you know, unemployed realtors, unemployed restaurant managers. And if, if you're ever going to have to potentially make a change in your staff, I think rehiring is actually going to be pretty good. Right. You know, I think there's going to be a flood of the job market to where if one staffer is just not working out for you. Uh, it's not a good fit. You pull the bandit off, you make the change and replace that with, with somebody who really, you know, wants to be there and has the capacity to do that role. So, you know, in a lean time or excuse me, in a better time, lean hiring where there's really low unemployment, you kind of have to take what comes across your desk sometimes, you know, I mean, sometimes, what do you, yes. on, sometimes, yeah. I mean, Matt, what do you comment on that? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I think it's good. The environment to grow your business could get really good uh, after 90 or 120 days, you know, we're focusing on surviving uh, so far in this uh, conversation, but there's also this thrive piece that's going to happen post 120, 150 days, however long it takes to kind of shake out where there's going to be a lot of opportunities for us to grow the business. I think real estate uh, sales are going to be down. People are going to need to rent their homes. Uh, people are going to have to move for their job, which is going to create all sorts of opportunities for us to be renting more houses. So now we've got a, we've got and got a perfect storm. If we, if we can survive this 120 days and thrive on, well, we're going to thrive on the other side. Think about where we can all of a sudden hire uh and, and we've got incredibly talented people at GK Houses, but now they're, it's going to be easier to find those incredibly talented people on the backside. And then uh, that'll allow us to, uh, to grow our business. And so one of the things we're really focused on is actually growing our sales organization right now. Um, you know, it's not, 
uh, it's, you know, you wouldn't think of it as a great time to be adding salespeople, but we're training salespeople right now with the idea that, hey, 90, 120 days, if we can kind of last through these first few punches, it's really going to be nice to grow our business on the backside of it. So let's yeah. thank the one person operator for a minute. Let's, let's think the, the single property manager company uh, person, you know, 100 homes, right? Uh, Deb, I know you consult with some of those where they have maybe 100, 150 homes, and they're like running it all themselves. I, I think of like Amy Carnes, for example. She did a great example. Is she sold her business in San Antonio, moved up to Dallas, and started from absolute scratch. And she built that thing up to like around 140, 150 homes, and she runs it herself with a part-time assistant. So any advice for those operators out there? Because – they're a big part of our community and they're a big part of uh, the property management world out there. There's, there's, there's not all these GK houses and rent works out there where they're, you know, big organizations we have, you know, in the tens and twenties and thirties for staffers. There's folks out there running around doing it all themselves. Any advice for them? Yeah. So I have two, two things to say. One is make sure you're using the right technology to help you streamline all of these things. Right? So we are part of this great organization. NARPM has some great affiliates that, um, allow us to choose the technology that will allow, you know, to streamline a lot of these processes, which is really what will work. The second thing is making sure you have these processes in place. So whether you're 100 doors, 150 doors, 300, 400, 900 or more, regardless, you still need standardized processes. And what I'm finding is that people kind of came to this point, were forced to now work from home, and they don't have these things written down. They didn't before, they don't now, and now they have no oversight to employees who are working from home, so what do you do? So now it's kind of a little bit of a scrambling, backpedaling, how, you know, how do I put this in place? And that's really what I'm helping them do. Excellent, good stuff, because um, there's gonna be some changes to where they're gonna wanna embrace it technology, one for unaccompanied vacant home showings, two for potentially right. lockbox move-ins to where the the new tenants can go straight to the home and not have to meet them at a Starbucks or come to their, you know, executive suite or whatever. Right. There's, there's lots of ways to skin that cat using the technology that we have. Well, and that's and, what people and, are right, and think of it this way. Think of the entire life cycle of property management, anywhere from onboarding your new owner or your new property to showings, like you said, so you've got that leasing part, the marketing piece, like how are we doing that today? How are we doing move-ins? we're having to kind of scramble to figure out how we can actually do these things remotely and more efficiently, but this doesn't have to stop just because of this pandemic. It can continue and it can actually help us improve our business and build out all of these, um, you know, these processes within these buckets along the way during this life cycle. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about the article that came out today about the, the feds covering some of the, the rental payments and the mortgage payments. Um, I'm trying to get back to it real quick to kind of reference it, but do you guys understand what I'm talking about there? Yeah, so NARPM came out with this kind of call to action, uh, which if you, uh, if you follow any of the NARPM kind of uh, outlets, uh, you can go in and basically uh, fill out a form, tells, tells you where you are, and it's basically kind of us collectively asking our state senators, our House of Representatives people, it's us asking them to basically uh, pay, give rent help instead of basically deferring rent so that uh, we give the money essentially to the residents, they pay us the rent. It basically, it basically gets the money flowing through the system through normal routes. I've seen a lot of like Facebook and LinkedIn articles saying, hey, we should just defer rent payments. We should defer uh, mortgage payments for 12 months. Well, obviously that cuts us as the property managers out of the middle. We don't want that. We want, we want it to go through the natural progression of what's happening already. And that's what this will do. And so you, all you have to do is pop, it's already got a pre-populated email that you'll send to them. All you got to do is uh, fill it out and hit send. And the more of us that can collectively do that, the better off we're going to be. Uh, Cause it's really kind of focused on our industry. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read this headline. U S orders up to a year long break on mortgage payments. So, they're, they're talking to the banks, especially when there's a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or VA yes. or FHA or right. uh, USDA loan, any one of those, you know, government backed loans, which is almost half of the loans that are being made. The, the feds are dictating to them. Well, dictating might be a strong word, but they're saying they're, they should, you know, work with the homeowners and letting them defer some of those payments. 
that could be as simple as tacking on three payments to the end, you know, 20 years from now, and they give them like a furlough for three months. But obviously the feds are coming out with, uh, with a method to uh, get the mortgage lenders to play nice. Because we talked about this on one of our very first episodes. It's the trickle-down effect. If the mortgage companies are going to ease up on the owners, that can allow the owners to ease up on the tenants. And the big variable is our manager fees. And if we can collect manager fees straight from the owner and or even take it out of the reserves, we can limp along for a month or two or three. And while this you know, thing out starts to subside and get through the business, get, the, get through these lean months in the businesses. Yeah. The other thing I think is important too uh, around cash, because I think, again, cash is going to be so incredibly important is um, a couple of things that I've found there's a lot of, we've been talking a lot about the federal level, the SBA. There's a lot of local options for us. Like in Birmingham, there's like a $25,000 loan uh, that's an interest-free loan for, it's either six or 12 months. So a lot of local authorities are putting these together. You can find them either through the, your local newspaper or a local website that is basically your newspaper today. Um, and then the other thing I saw was um, the SBA, if you have any SBA-backed loans, you can actually request a deferral of payments. So uh, you may even be able to get like either an uh, either principal free interest only loan, or you may could even get for some period of time, your payments deferred. And this will, this should help you obviously with your cash flow. Uh, so until we have some clarity on what's going to happen. Go ahead, Deb. No, I agree. I think I, I think the biggest thing that I see that people are worried about is cash flow. So we need to, you know, it, in essence, we all know this, we don't get paid until rent's received. So how do we plug that hole? Well, except for some, not everyone, but um, but most. As like yeah, and, and I say that because said. <laughs> I, I say that because, you know, we have a flat fee model. And right. so the manager fees are billed at a flat fee per month, no matter what. And so the, the challenge with the percentage model, unless you have a minimum built into your management agreement, the challenge with the percentage model is to try and figure out if you can keep your cash flow the same. That's not 100% accurate because some people have flat fee models and still don't take their fee until rents received. So I don't know if it matters if it's flat fee or percentage. It matters on how your management agreement or what that agreement is with that owner. So if you as right. a company, if, if as a company you don't take your fees out until rents received, that's the problem. So okay, so let's let's do some math here for me. So that two thousand dollar a month home that you're managing, now you're accepting a thousand bucks for this month because your owner tells you to to accept a thousand bucks. Your ten percent manager fee is now cut in half. Not necessarily. Why would it be? Because it's a debt. Because it's percentage. It's percentage right. based. It'll, no. Unless, okay. unless you have a minimum. No, unless hold you, on. Hold on. Let's say your percentage, and let's just say for easy numbers, it's 10%. The rent's 2000 Your management fee is 10%. You take your 10% off of the entire rent amount. You can't control, regardless of this situation, you can't control whether or not a tenant is going to pay partial rent or not. That's just part of life. Some tenants will pay all of it. Some people, some will pay partial. It's whatever your policies that you have in place, but your agreement needs to be able to, you, you should be able to take your management fees in full with partial payment. So that, that comes that's, back, to, that that comes back to how you're structuring your yeah. contracts. And that, that goes to your good coaching. And, you know, Matt and I, we've been looking at this for years is to make sure it's, it's a percentage of the collected rent. If it reads collected rent, you might be putting yourself in a bad position. Correct. So, right. so this, is where, right. this is where strong agreements are gonna make the difference for you. And that's one of the things I do is when I'm working with a, you know, I'm working with a, a client, I'm looking at all of their contracts, I'm looking at their revenue streams, I'm looking at all of this because you're right, those things do matter. It's how do you structure your contracts so that you can ensure that regardless of rent being paid or not being paid, you're being paid. So those are some of the things that we wanna look at. Um, because you're right, we can't do this for free, and we realize that tenants are not going to be able to pay. And how are we now? You know, owners still want us to manage a property, 
And we're like, great, but we got to get paid by whom? So there has to be some sort of a clause in the contract as well that also would allow for, a, a, you know, a catastrophic event and not, I'm not talking a mother nature event. I am talking about a pandemic epidemic event that allows us still to get paid in situations like this. We're not prepared. So how do we do that? Yeah. Matt, any party comments? No, I would just say uh, a lot's going to happen probably over the weekend. We're going to get some more clarity on how many people actually have this. We still aren't have no clue. I mean, there's still no clarity. Uh, but my guess is that the feds are going to work through the weekend. We're going to have some clarity on what they're going to do for us. Uh, one thing, and Brad, you can tell, tell everybody how to do this, but I did get a COVID-19 risk assessment PDF that would probably be helpful for people. It basically goes through kind of all the potential pain points and maybe if somebody out there, how, however best to get them this PDF, I think it would be helpful. Uh, it's, you know, I, you know, I, I think it, it'll just take you through each piece of your business and how you can plan on uh, preparing for some sort of impact due to this. Yeah, get that to me and we can post it to several different places. We can post it on YouTube. We can, you know, there, there's a way to do attachments on LinkedIn. We can post it on our website. We can post it in Facebook. I mean, there's all kinds of ways we can get that out there. So uh, let me and my team help with that. You know, I've got a team that, that works on the mastermind group, so we can definitely assist with it. Monday, we're coming back, same time, same back channel, 4.30 Central Standard Time. Be able to syndicate this no later than 5 Central Standard Time. I'm uh, going to have Phil Mazur on Monday, and he's going to be talking about how to manage the cash flow. I mean, specifically CFO type stuff, chief financial officer stuff. And so what we had today was uh, some very good real deal property management uh, perspectives from Matt and Deb. Deb, thank you for coming on. Appreciate your effort on this. And uh, we'll see you guys on Monday. Let's hold tight for the weekend. All right, take care. Bye. Thanks.